point. And with that, we're off to the races. Again, good afternoon, all. Welcome to our Monday seminar on September 18th. We're going to be talking about the internship today. We will record this and we'll post it up on the website after we're done. As I mentioned, as questions come, please feel free to post them up in the um, in the chat. If you would, if you're if you're not speaking for now, go ahead and mute, um, just so we don't get that back that background noise. We love the dogs, but uh, not on the not on the recording. So, with that, um, Doug, I'm going to pass it over to you to 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 start us off. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so Robert will be actually teaching um, and be the instructor of record, but I've got some experience doing this. So we'll go through kind of all the requirements and that, that type of thing um, as we go. So I think we can just go on beyond the agenda. One page there, oh, well, there we go. Um, Okay, so what, why, why do we even have an internship? Um, you know, let's start with that one. So all master's degrees require a capstone project, um, whether that's a thesis, uh, like a written thesis. That's the way I went through my my master's thesis. I wrote two different theses for each master's. Um, in this case, we were we started as a professional mass master's program, which was more of a capstone internship. And what the thesis or the project does is really synthesizes all the information that you've learned from your coursework to be able to say, I can actually build you know, a whole project together that integrates all your skills. Um, it also allows you to you know, meet with professional mentors and networking and that type of thing, which is kind of a side benefit of doing a, an internship, um, but you will be doing that. Um, you know, and so, we have a few requirements. Uh, they're different by HIA, health informatics and analytics and, and data science and business analytics. We'll, we'll talk about each of those as we go when there are differences. What is the same is you have to have 160 hours of work towards the project. Um, that can be spread out, you know, basically 10 hours a week for 16 weeks. Can be shorter than that. Most of the semesters in the spring is 16 weeks. You can work 10 or more. You don't have to work exactly 160 hours. You can work more and many, many students do, but a minimum of 160 hours of work um, within your project. Um, the biggest thing kind of to remember is that, well, a couple things. Number one, you've got to get your project approval proposal done before you can register for the class, which means you're backed up you know, several weeks before the semester if not at least a month, particularly for HIA, um, where you're working for a healthcare company that has requirements like background checks and getting different shots and doing other things when you work inside of a healthcare company. Each company has something different. There is a process to manage that, um, which means you're um, generally a month out. So for spring, it would be great you know, if your proposal was in by December 1st. Um, I know some of you are going to slip a little bit beyond that, but, um, you know, if you have your proposal in by December 1st, we can actually, you know, do it without panicking. Um, but that means that you need to get a an internship position, get enough knowledge with your mentor that will be leading you in that project to be able to write the proposal. So you do need to have a designated mentor, sometimes called preceptor, um, that will be within the company that you're working for. Uh, that will help you really understand what the project is, that type of thing. Um, now, one of the differences between the HIA and the DSBA is the HIA is set up as a mid, mid degree. And so you'll have your first four classes out of the way, and then you're ready to start. This gets into what exactly is required. And then in the DSBA, it's kind of end. Um, end, of, end of your program, whether you have to have a minimum of 21 hours, um, but a lot of people do it the last semester they are actually enrolled um, so that that kind of transitions straight into a job is the hope. Um, I think we'll talk about more differences later, um, but uh, Josh, I think if you can go to the next page. Robert, would you add anything else? Yeah, so we had a couple of good questions in the chat as well, Doug. I'll, I'll speak to one of them and then have you speak to one of the other questions. Um, the first question uh, from Anders was about the 21-hour requirement. And he noted that sometimes there was uh, an ability to have an exception 
for maybe fewer hours, such as 18 hours. And the, the guidance here is to keep in mind for students that the, the intent behind that hour re requirement is to uh, ensure that you have some experience and some skills built up in your graduate degree so that you can practice those within your internship. So there is a possibility that you might be okay with 18 hours if it looks like what you've taken in the past is going to allow you to succeed in your internship, then we would approve your uh, application with 18 hours. Um, and so that was one of the questions, Doug, and I don't know if you have anything to add to that. The other one yeah. is an internship that spans more than one semester. So okay, so let me ask the, the first one is, is really you need to be through most of your coursework. And if you haven't applied, if you absolutely haven't taken applied machine learning yet, you're not gonna get approved to uh, actually go at 18 hours. So one of those courses must be applied machine learning at least. Now there are other requirements because we want to see you do a data science project, right? And so you're going to need to predict something and you won't necessarily have the skills if you haven't taken some of the classes that are actually the more advanced. So advanced business and business analytics, the applied machine learning, some of the advanced electives, we really want to see you have those so that you can be a data scientist in the role. And so we really look at what courses you've taken in those, if you're going to have less than 21, to scrutinize it. We we try not to actually approve anything under 21 hours, um, but sometimes we will. Um, on the other one, the where the conversation, where you span a semester. So if you, let's say, start in October and you're going to March, right? It is possible. You're gonna to need to go ahead and put your proposal in. Um, you'll actually have work experience, so you'll know a heck of a lot more about the project you're gonna do. The 160 hours needs to occur during the semester that you're enrolled in the course. So if you are enrolled in the course from January, whatever the date is, January 12th or 15th, the classes start up until the end of March, you need 160 hours in that time. You just happen to have worked for the company ahead of time, and that's great. But you need that 160 hours during that time, and you'll write your proposal work and your um, updates on that 160 hours during the semester. Um, so it's, a, it's okay to span. Um, generally, it's usually the second part and not the first part. Um, there are other things that if it's the, you're working say you're working now and you're gonna span into February, but you're enrolled in the course in the fall, right? You can get an incomplete um, and then finish your, your project up afterwards. That's not a preferred choice and it has all kinds of costs and, and extra work that goes with it, but it is possible. Generally, you have the big project is really just, you have to have those contact hours during the semester that uh, you're, you're enrolled. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Okay. Um, I think next page then. Okay. So lots of different companies. Um, these are great sources. You're, as you're starting to look for them, you can use this page. There's a great uh, uh, analytics and data uh, what do they call it? Technology Data Analytic Career Week next week. And so make sure you do that. A lot of these companies will be there. Um, but you, these are the kind of the places that are most likely, but you can find a job anywhere. Um, if you are going to work remote, there is a checkbox in the um, proposal application that says, you know, I'm working in Charlotte, but my job, you know, the company's in Los Angeles or wherever, um, and that's fine. Uh, the reason why we have that is actually there's a state requirement to report on where you're working um, within your your internships, and so we do know we need to know both where you are working, physically working, could be your home, just needs to know it's Charlotte, North Carolina, or Weddington, North Carolina, or Huntersville, or wherever. We don't need a specific address and where the company is located. It doesn't have to be the same place, but these companies are all Charlotte-based mostly that are you see here, and it spans a very broad range and uh, of companies. And, you know, the HIA internships generally are in health-related. DSBA internships are both health-related and other places. 
Doug, I'll also add in, as you look at this list, um, what we can also say, while this is not an inclusive list, these are all places that UNC Charlotte School of Data Science students have interned at some point. That we've had folks working with these different units, these organizations as well. And a lot of them have already been on campus. A lot of them are coming back um, for, for subsequent events. We'll talk more about that. And the other piece about it is often, in almost all of these, we have alumni. Right. And so one of the things you can do is you're looking at LinkedIn, you see who's got a DSBA or an HIA degree. You can reach out to them and say, hey, I'm looking for an internship. You're working at, you know, City of Charlotte or the Department of Public Health. And, you know, do you know of anything where I could do my internship there as well? Um, and so that's one of those things. Use your alumni network in the companies that you're targeting to be able to say, usually your alumni will be very there'll be more responsive, let's just say, than an HR person um, who's just hammered with thousands of resumes. So, okay. Bob, anything, Robert, anything else? Uh, just one last note maybe is that I've noticed that the Monday seminar series tends to host a lot of companies that are also interested in internships. It's a great opportunity to speak to those people. They may or may not know information about internships, but it's another good source. But it's, Yeah, it's a good source to at least, you know, you can get your resume to them and they can take it to the HR team. Um, so sometimes it's better to go that way versus just straight into a website. Okay, next page. All right, for health informatics, um, you know, there's a difference between the health informatics and the DSB, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, because they're earlier in your program and because of the difference in the health in the programs now, we have a new um, data science track within HIA, so that may be a little different over time, but right now it's not. Um, the key, as it says in kind of the diagonal text, is really to utilize health data to help make decisions. It can be a data quality project. It can be compiling data, visualizing data, predicting, doing an analysis of a, a clinical trial, any of that, um, you know, standard operating procedures for data processes, all of that are very good projects for the health informatics and analytics project. Um, it, it can be modeling and predicting, although it does not have to be, and that's gonna be the difference. Um, if you go to the next page, right? The data science, you have to be doing basically some kind of predictive advanced visualization or predicting something, a database, you know, managing a database or doing a simple statistical analysis and reporting on it is not enough for the data science and business analytics internship. Um, so that's usually where most of the questions come when Robert or I or, or the instructor are looking at the your proposals and it's like, okay, it looks like you're building a database here. Um, that's not enough. What are you going to go predict? Sometimes your bosses don't know what you're capable of. And so we all have plenty of experience with projects. A lot of us worked in industry before coming here, and we can often suggest things for you to take that you're capable of doing that you can take to your manager and say, or your mentor and say, hey, I would be like interested in doing this. And then we'd be like, oh, that's a cool idea. Yeah, let's do that. Um, they would not even know that you, you're capable of doing that. So it's not, not everything is necessarily always going to come from your mentor, your mentor. That's what the instructors are here for is to help you shape your internship and make suggestions back on what you're fully capable of doing. But that's also why we want you to have more credits under your belt and have finished that so that you can actually do all this type of analysis that we're teaching you more on your electives than in the core of the, the data DSBA. Uh, Robert, anything else that you would say? No, that that was a really good call out. Uh, the I, the fact that sometimes mentors or people who are you know looking for interns will have them work on databases or reports just because that's all they know, right? So, bringing your data science skills to the table is definitely maybe one of those hidden challenges here. Got to be a little creative in helping uh, those businesses use data science. Okay, I think we can move on. Um, okay, so how do you find an internship? Well. It starts now, should have started the first day you went into class on your first semester. Um, you haven't quite got there, you know, then now's the time to start. Um, you know, as, as we said, if you're interested in spring, really December 1st is the time if you're interested in that you need to have it all locked in. If it's 
in the summer, right? You really need to have things kind of by the first of April, latest mid April um, to really start the summer on time. Um, so the career center, your, well, let me first start with our Monday professional seminars, four o'clock, this is one of those. We just usurped that for um, one of the weeks, but every week, you know, there's hosting down at uh, the Dubois Center, four o'clock, some company is presenting and they're here to recruit students, um, whether they're talking about their general work, whether they're talking about something specific, that's, that's a very good start. The University and Career Affairs, this is, uh, so this career fair next week is the third career fair um, that's happened since the start of the semester. There was one that you were invited to that was with the, that CCI hosted, right? There was a general one last week, and then this is the third one that's really focused on technology, data, data science, data analytics. Um, so that's one of those, your career site is one of the best things to go through. Right. Make sure your resume looks professional. Use the career center sites to be able to do that, um, to say, hey, yeah, this is uh, my LinkedIn profile looks good. You know, it's not expected that you're good at this out of the box, but we've got a lot of resources for you to learn from. Um, then, of course, networking. Right. So the professional seminars are part of networking, but are so are many other things you're going to be invited to. Um, grow your LinkedIn network, but be strategic on it. Just don't plaster the world. Um, when you write a LinkedIn request, tell them why you want to, to, to connect with them, right? Don't just hit the box and say, I'm not going to send you a message. You need to send a custom message to whomever you're, you're working your things on. Um, and then, right, there's other things to do. There's going to be competitions, hackathons. You can publish if you're doing research with faculty. GitHub sites are a new, you know, a good thing to have. So make sure your GitHub site is professional looking and then put it on your resume and your profile. So um, Robert, other things? We have a training on GitHub coming the week after next. So with Colby Ford, an alumni of the program, which is great. I think Anders has a question. Yes, if I if I may speak, I'm listening and driving, so I'm not going to text at the same time. But um, I just Thank wanted you. to- uh, Thank you. I want, yeah, I just wanted to bring up something for um, uh, career fairs. Uh, so I went to the one this past week and a lot of people found this really impressive is I uh, I printed out a QR code that goes straight to my resume from my Google Docs. So if like, if you have a GitHub or a LinkedIn that's like linked on your resume, that's a really easy way for them to get access rather than just a physical copy. Yep. That's great. Yep, QR codes and GitHub sites and, Right, bringing it up on your phone so that they can scan it is a wonderful thing. Technology is your help here. Now, the one thing I would say is not very effective, right, is only relying on Indeed and Monster to apply for jobs, right? Um, it's possible. I will say there are jobs that have gotten off Indeed and Monster, but the probability of you getting a job off of that versus one of these other methods is pretty low. Um, and so, you know, don't exclusively rely on web job websites to be posting. Now, if someone tells you, please go post to our site on here, you've already got, they already know who you are. And so they can pick you out. Um, but just blindly applying is very, very difficult to get a, get an internship in a position possible, but difficult. And can I add into that as well? I mean, this goes in part to the career fair. The career fair for some of you, those who went, was a bit overwhelming because there's so many students and they're all swarming and the, and the queue lines are long and, and you don't get much of a chance to talk to the recruiters. They're a little bit overwhelmed. You've got to look at it a bit of a different way. What, what the career fair does is it helps you understand what the, the lay of the land, the, the opportunities are within the Charlotte region. Those are companies who are specifically recruiting UNC Charlotte students, which means that you have an opportunity to follow up, but you may need to find some other pathways to develop a relationship, to build that network, to get a conversation about a position that might be appropriate for you. As you're looking at these, some of you, Doug mentions this issue of LinkedIn and Indeed and, and spamming out 200 plus applications and hoping something's going to come back. Understand when you start looking at national companies like AWS, or you start looking at Microsoft or some, well, there's Microsoft here, but you start getting some of those large name brand organizations. You're competing against not only the folks on this campus, 
but the entire country. And it just, you're putting yourself at a strategic disadvantage because you're just one person in a sea of applicants. Whereas if you're focusing on the Charlotte companies and you're building those networks here, you really have an advantage to, to landing that position that you really want. So take advantage and, and focus on the local. Don't get lost in, in just the, the resume count that you send out. Yeah, and one other thing that I'll just throw in is know who you're trying to apply to, right? The As when I was recruiting and I was working in corporations, the, the worst thing that just immediately eliminated somebody, no matter how good they were, is if they knew nothing about my company, right? Whether it's Bank of America or... Premier or whomever, if you don't know something about the company, what their recent issues are, what their recent press releases, and why are you applying to me, right? That's what you've got to actually do your research on any company that you want to apply for. Now, career fairs is a little bit different, but you still should be targeting particular companies that you know something about. Um, and so one of the pet peeves of almost anybody that's hiring is if you don't know something about the company, you're eliminated. Now, what you can do to stand out is actually know something about the company. Because um, if you do know something and you know what they're doing and their issues they're trying to, to work out, um, either publicly or privately, you know, you know something about it, then you'll actually stand out about above others because most people don't know much about the companies they're applying to, right? All these banks are not just retail banks, right? They're not just the banking center on the quarter. They have a commercial side. They have a corporate side. They have lots of different businesses that you need to know about um, because you may hit somebody on the retail side, but you may not. Um, so know the companies you're applying to. Okay, let's move on. All right, so we hit most of this already. Um, professional organizations, we, we didn't talk a lot about those. Um, so let me, let me go let ahead. Me Real quick. So we have us on both the HIA and the DSBA website, we've got a community resources page with links to several of these meetup groups, but you can also find them through through the meetup site itself. You can search for local Charlotte Python groups, um, R Shiny. There's a variety of ways. The um, For a long time, the um, Lake Norman had a really good machine learning network that was that would meet on a regular basis. And these are opportunities, again, for you not only to, to, to network, but to also get into some interesting projects and problems that those, those groups are, are going after, topics that they're looking at. So you are part of this community. You're at UNC Charlotte. You should be getting off campus whenever you can to get into that community and, and learn about a lot of those companies that we've, we've been talking about already. So again, those are on the, um, those are on the website and you can follow up. Most of you know about the, um, the aggregator that the Career Center has put together, I'm gonna to put this in the chat again um, so that you've got it. Hire a Niner, they've created a special aggregator for data science related jobs. Some of them are a little wonky because um, anything mentioned data kind of falls in there, but it is a way to sort through the rather voluminous number of Hire a Niner postings um, to focus specifically on positions and internships you may be interested in. All right. So, and there's our newsletter, right? Anybody that sends me a job we go, generally goes to the bottom of our newsletter. Um, so you'll be able to see that as well. Um, we will have in on reading day, we have our industry board meeting. And then after the board meeting, there'll be a reception. Uh, so it's a little late for spring internships. But if you're looking for summer or that, that's a good way to network and get introduced to many of our industry partners that are very invested in the program. Okay. Robert, anything else? Um, one thing that we might talk about a little bit more is what if you already have a full-time job and mm -hmm. your company is not going to allow you to intern with another company? Can you find an internship within your company and what are the guidelines there maybe? You want me to answer that or you want to answer those? I, I, I'd like you to answer. <laughs> All right. So um, generally we ask that if you are a, a if you're within a company, that you do a project that is not with your current boss. Um, that's generally the guidelines is to, you know, try and get outside of your current career, right, or your current job and, right, work somewhere else in the company and do a project for them. Now, you got to work the 160 hours and all that type of thing, and that, that needs to be focused on the 
position. And many people do that outside of their normal work hours um, so that they're doing that. Now, if you can arrange with your boss to be able to, to, to finagle that, then I'll, we leave that up to you. Uh, but, you, you know, one of the things that we do find that we can be an advantage for you is let's just say you, you've been working in the same team for five years or eight years, right? You're ready to do something else. Maybe it's a technology team. Maybe it's a reporting team. What we you can do is say, look, you know, my program requires me to do be outside of this group. So can you please point me to the data science groups inside my company, inside our company, so that we can then, you know, I can actually meet the requirements of the job. Um, that way you're actually learning the data science organizations outside of your current team um, and helps you network within your company. And so that's something you can use us as kind of the bad guy that says, hey, my, my program is requiring this. Now, if you get stuck and you, you already work in a data science team and it's the only data science team in the company, then you come talk to Robert or myself or whoever the instructor is and we we work something out, but we do try and make it outside of your normal day-to-day -day duties so that it's a stretch goal that you use these new skills that you're learning in. Um, but that's kind of the exception. Generally, we want you to try and be working inside the company, which is fine. Um, there are some times where they get cautious about confidentiality and what you can do and what we require you to do is to basically de-identify and remove any confidential information now, the instructor needs to know enough that says, yes, you're doing quality work in data science, but I don't need to know that, you know, you're working on something and 375 clients are the top list and they're worth a million dollars a piece. We don't care about that. We just want to know that you've done the classification and you've got a probability and you have a cutoff. Um, we don't really care the specifics, which is generally the confidential information. If you have trouble with that, then that's, that's a good thing to work with your, your instructor on. Anything else, Robert, that you would add? No, no, that's great. And hopefully your company is supportive of your educational path, right? Um, they know that you're in school and working towards improving yourself. So hopefully that's an easier conversation to have. But it can be difficult because you might be asked to do your responsibilities in addition to, like uh, Doug said, kind of a stretch, right? Some additional responsibilities. Um, so you might spread yourself a little bit thinner. Um, so just one final point on this with the newsletters, Doug mentioned that we, we put the jobs at the bottom. That means when you look at the preview in your email, you're not going to see the full newsletter. You got to download it to get to the bottom, to get to the jobs and the internship postings that we highlight. And those are by no means the only ones, but they're just some of the ones we've selected and kind of put in there and curated. They've been shared with us, et cetera. Um, but another resource, and you should have gotten this in your email today, um, I just put a link to the career communities for data and technology. The Career Center has put together one heck of an incredible week next week um, in terms of events, seminars, meetups, um, panel discussions around data, data science, data analytics, and the, and the community. So um, the link to your career community is in the chat, um, and you can find the calendar there. We will resend that notice again probably tomorrow to make sure that everybody's aware of it. And whatever time you can apportion out to be in those conversations, please join in. It'll be a really useful one. Very, very impressed with what uh, the Career Center has done this time around. Gentlemen, do you want to add anything? No, this is this is uh, one of the best ones I've seen um, put together. So, and it's spread out, so you don't have to be at everything, but you know you can find times, and some of them are in the evening if you're working. So, um, this is just day one. There's, there's, this is just day one. There are four days of it. Okay. Um, so I already shared with folks links to the HIA and the DSBA internship sites. So you can go back and take a look at that. Um, the, um, the, the goals, uh, well, Doug, do you want to talk a little bit more about, because this is getting more into the proposal part of it. I think you've hit a lot of these points already, but. Um, yeah. So as you're, you don't have to write a book, but you need to write enough information. Usually one sentence is not enough for each of the little sections of your proposal, right? So as you are doing your proposal, the links are in there and you can, I think we've opened up, Josh, have we opened up the spring proposal yet? Yeah, it should be open on the site. Okay, so um, there will be, 
you can go ahead and do it, or you can at least look at it and see what you're going to have to put. Um, but it is, you're going to have to talk to your mentor to get enough information to know what you're doing. Um, you know, what type of modeling, what are you going to predict, um, that type of thing. What tools are you going to use? That's all within there um, with that. So, yeah, there's a lot of information um, within there. We've harmonized the courses. So basically all the, the homeworks and assignments are the same between the two. Um, oh, the one thing we haven't talked about is grading. Um, do we talk about that later? I don't uh, know. No, we don't. Okay. okay, so grading. So the DSBA is done. So everybody gets a score, um, and you will receive a numerical score for your assignments and the overall, and it's weighted and all of that. For DSBA, it uh, basically is a pass-fail course. Um, and so you either pass or you don't. For HIA, it's actually graded. Um, there were some different philosophies as we came up through the two programs, um, and it's also earlier, so, um, you know, a little bit less is required in the HIA as far as output, um, but the grading takes that into account. So HIA does give an ABCU, and then DSBA is basically pass-fail. And so that that is one difference, but, you know, usually students don't pay much attention to that um, until the end. Um, I think that's, you know, what you deliver is one of those things we want to know about. What are you expecting to deliver? You will develop a project plan. The project plan, you know, hopefully for you, it'll be, you planned it, it'll just go straight forward. That's actually the rare case. Usually project plans, your boss comes and says, I need you to work on this versus what we had planned. That's okay. You just have to document that and, and let us know about it. Um, and then hopefully you'll still have the kind of the full result at the end that you're predicting something. But Major changes do happen. Um, just come talk to your instructor. All right, anything else? Timelines, we talked a lot about this. HIA is at least a month um, because you have all the shots and background checks and stuff requirements. We say two weeks prior, but generally it's better if it's a month, you'll get much better feedback. Um, and so the way it works is you submit your proposal, which is a Google form your mentor information, all of that. Um, Robert will be looking it over for the spring. It'll be a different instructor in the summer. Um, but they'll say, yep, this is good enough. Um, Josh, please authorize them for the course. And then you'll be able to enroll in, in the DSBA 6400 after that, um, or the HCIP 6400. Um, or one of the other things that happens fairly frequently is Robert or I or whomever will give you a note said, hey, you know, what do you think? Can you do something? Can you go back to your mentor and, and see if you can do more of a predictive model or have some suggestions for what type of you can do? Um, and there'll be a little bit of back and forth on where you need to improve. Hopefully you'll do a bang up job and it'll all be clear. You'll write your what you're going to be doing in there and it'll be perfectly acceptable and you'll just get a yes. That's the good case. Um, but there are some times for back and forth, which is really why you need that time ahead of time so that you can enroll, so that you then pay your bill. And you don't have to do that all within a 24 hour period because we're after the uh, when classes have officially started. So it gets really tight if you're not doing that. Um, and just to remind you, you can't register, right? You're blocked from registering until you get your proposal approved. Um, so you need to do that ahead of time. And which means you need to have the job offer, which means you have to be able to talk to your mentor even before that. And and we'll get this so because we're going to start registering for spring classes before you know it. And we have a form that we send out. People will request the DSBA or the HCIP 6400. We're not even going to respond. We won't issue the authorization unless it's been there's, there's a proposal that's in the pipeline that's been approved. Um, so just just so you know. Yeah, and okay. just to just to reiterate, that was a really good call out by Doug that you need to have that conversation with your mentor before you do your proposal. And to to some extent, we're a counterparty. We're we're forcing that conversation to kind of help you make sure that you have a successful internship, right? And many times you'll find that a mentor will say, "Yeah, I want a data science intern," but then they don't necessarily have a concrete plan for you. So. We're here to help push that forward uh, to the forefront so that you do have success later on in your internship. 
All right. Okay, let's see. Proposing by weekly pro. Oh, yeah. So we talk a little bit about once you're registered, we gave a lot of that beforehand. Um, what you do during the, the course is you write a project proposal. That's the first thing to do. And then every two weeks, you have a new progress report. If you are on a weird schedule that's not just a normal, I'm taking it during the full semester, you're going to have to work out timing of all your submissions with your instructor. Right. So if you do end in March, then you're going to have to do your progress reports probably every week instead of every other week. Um, and so that's can we do reach out to your mentors um, and we do not include you in those emails. Um, and so we will reach directly out to them right, and ask them for at the beginning. Hey, we understand you agreed to be a mentor. Please respond and fill out this survey that says, yep, I agreed. And at the end, we do a little survey on, hey, how did you do? What did you think? Would you like a new would you like a new intern next semester? All that kind of thing. And so that we're going to be reaching out twice to your your preceptors and mentors to say, hey, both confirming that they did agree and then at the end that uh, it went all right. Um, and so we do do that. Just, and if we don't get a response from your mentor, then we'll email you and say, hey, please go poke your mentor and say, please respond to the email you got from Robert Fox or Doug Haig or whomever your instructor is. Okay, I think that's all. And then after that, there's a final report, um, 10 pages long. Uh, there's an outline in the in the syllabus and in the Canvas module with a, with examples as well. We have exemplars on all of this now. Um, and then a final presentation. Now the final presentation is quick. It's generally between seven and 10 minutes. And so you don't have a lot of time to get across what you did. Um, but the details go in the report and the high level work comes in the presentation. If you're at a company that's worried about confidentiality, sometimes you have to clear both of those through your company before you can submit them. And so make sure you leave enough time to do that if it's required at your company. Sorry, I jumped. Anything else on this one? No. Okay. If we're coming in the home stretch. Ah. Okay. Oh. No, I think we want all the yeah, there we go. This is we Okay, I, I said this already. Um oh student evaluations. Um Student evaluations of the internship? No, that's just your student evaluation. Yeah, for the class evaluation. It's for the class. It's not a Google form. Right. Um, right. It, you do get to evaluate, you know, why do you think this? And, and just remember, when you're evaluating the, the class and why was this helpful to you, that the original purpose we talked to at the beginning is to show that you can integrate all your skills together because you've taken a lot of individual classes where you build individual skills you've never shown you can do it together. That's what this class is for. Okay, next. I think that's it. That's it. All yeah. right, we can open things up. And Josh did put in the uh, in the chat that the Google Forms are not open yet. They will be opened uh, later this week. Um, tomorrow I'll have them up and running. Um, one other thing I'll put in one more Google form. Uh, we shared this as an email earlier today, but if you have not, we usually collect a uh, resume book for students who are actively looking for internships in the following semester. So we just opened up the one for, for spring. We will share this with all of our advisory board members and any of our community partners who, who request it. Um, it is not in and of itself a, a silver bullet to find, in a, to find an internship, but sometimes we we're able to get some some interest from our partners and they may follow up. So if you'd like to be part of that, please go ahead. Here's the link to submit your current resume. Make sure that please make sure, as we said earlier, that you've had it reviewed. Um, you've had extra eyes on it. Remember, the a resume should not simply be a laundry list. Um, it should tell a story and it should tell a perspective story. Where, where, where can you go with this company? So... Don't just try to cram as much as you can by by minimizing the font, please. Oh, okay. Um, there's a question. It's uh, around the sports internship count. Um, and I will go back to your proposal. 
And are you demonstrating that you are incorporating and blending all the skills that you've learned in the DSBA, or I guess you said DSBA, it can count. There have been struggles. Um, Anders is going through this, I think right now. Um, you have to be able to predict, right? And just remember you're blending a lot of different um, skill sets in those internships. And so it requires special work above and beyond kind of the normal sports analytics internship where you go and collect stats at the game. Um, you do have to make a prediction, but Anders, you're raising your hand. Do you want to help address this? Yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead and um, address that. So I had um, two people from the DSBA program um, actually drop. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll give some preface. I'm the lead um, student analyst intern for the football team. So right now, um, I don't get course credit um, or like anything for it. I'm just doing it for the experience. So this is not kind of my DSBA internship. But um, just to reiterate on what they said, it has to be um, predictive modeling. So you need to be really sure about what sport you're going into because a lot of our teams don't have really um, the kind of funding to do the analytics in-house that you think you want to do. So that's kind of something that you need to pioneer yourself. So if you're going to do a sports um, internship, you need to have an idea and um, have that proposal ready. I would also reach out to coaches and see if that's something that they can facilitate for you. Because as far as the football one is concerned, um, there are two students that are DSBA right now, and they've talked to me about their proposals, but they haven't come to me with like predictive modeling. They've just asked me to help them answer their questions, which I haven't really been much help with. So just be sure if you're going to do sports, be prepared and just also um, make sure that you're in the right sport beforehand. So you don't have to deal with all of this um, jumping through hoops just to make sure you get the proposal done in the right kind of time. Frame. Yeah. And, and I think we did actually have a couple people drop um, that were originally in the sports internship because they couldn't figure out and weren't ready with the data to be able to do it in a timely manner. Um, so I would just say, if you want this to work, it can work, but there's an extra hoop and an extra difficulty that goes with that. That's really put on you um, because there isn't as much of a mentorship program within the coaching staff um, that is really able to do that. And so a lot of it gets put back on the student. Um, and so just be careful with it if that's the path you wanna do. The other thing that, that kind of brings up is other internships on campus. It is possible, it is not what we encourage. We encourage you to find a position at an external company. Um, it is possible, but we really wait till the last minute um, to suggest you're doing it. I would continue looking externally. It is possible to do something as a research project on campus um, with a faculty member. Um, they will, you know, potentially have projects and you'll have to talk to the faculty member. That's usually done once you get to the two week period and you're really struggling um, to find an internship and you're going to graduate. If you're not going to graduate this sem that semester, then I would suggest you don't go down that path. At some point, if you're not graduating in May or August, we will actually are launching a research based thesis. So you can write a thesis, but it's a two semester long project um, with a faculty. So you can start to delve into research. It's really meant for those people that are thinking about a PhD. Um, so that will be an option, but it will not be an option this year. Anders, did you have something else you wanted to say? Um, yeah, I just actually had a question for, uh, for myself, if that's all right. Sure. Okay, so um, since I'm a first uh, semester student in the DSBA program, what's an ideal time frame for me to be looking for an internship? Because when I was at the career fair, I had a really good talk with um, uh, Toyota Racing Development, and uh, they said that they offer summer internships. Yep. So would an ideal time frame for me for like looking for something like that, would that be like summer of 2025? 2024, you mean? Well, I'm asking, it should, should, should it be 2024, 2025? Because my track right now is three classes per semester. Yeah, so this is where you're going to get, if you're at three classes a semester, you won't meet the, the requirement, right? Okay. To have 21 credit hours to have summer right. one. Now there's a nuance because we have a summer two class too. So if mm -hmm. you're working full time, 
and maybe you take one class in summer one and you get it done, mm -hmm. you'll have the 21 credit hours by summer two. Um, so there okay. is a little hoop that you could jump through, um, but it's going to be tough. Um, so if there are companies that also have okay. internships okay. in the summer, uh, but you're, that, that's where you run into the, the, the 21 credit hour limit. Yeah, I got you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but I, I would be looking now for summer of 2024 if that's when you want to do your internship. And and Doug, you may want to, or Robert, you may want to talk about the fact that a lot, a lot of the large companies tend to have fairly rigid summer internship programs. And so for folks looking for spring, um, that may help them in adjusting to a different type of company to, to look for an internship. Yeah, the one the one thing is we 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 are putting requirements on you. You know, doing a database project for HIA or doing a predictive modeling for DSBA. If you look at these summer programs that there's, you know, 100 interns at the company and it's a generic, it's not a data science internship, you're really going to struggle getting the attention of a mentor or of an actually doing a data science related project in those programs. Those are really summer related. A lot of times they're undergraduate and they mix master students in there but they're, they're not actually doing projects. You're just working on a team and they're not responsible, but we need you to be for this. And so I would just, if that's the case and you're looking through it, those are great internships, but you're probably not gonna be able to do it as the, as the course. So just be careful, um, you know, as you're, recruit, as you're doing recruiting and, and, you know, looking for the internship that you have something that actually does, uh, you know, meet the requirements of our of our degree and the, being able to show the integration of skills. Other questions? I just threw a sample of one that would work as a summer internship, which B of A does their quant, their summer Quant Analytics program, which is a which is a great program for our students as well, but very competitive. Very competitive, and that would work. Wells Fargo's got one, Truist has got one, but they're all focused on quant. There are other internship programs at Bank of America that would not work. Um, and so you just have to be careful which one you're applying for and, and getting. Other questions? I used, to, I used to run that one, actually, that he... He put in. Thanks, Josh. What a coincidence. Yeah, and Anders. Yeah, so um, once I'm uh, like, uh, if I'm figuring out my roadmap for the rest of the um, master's, should I reach out to, um, should I reach out to Robert or somebody else in the program concerning like when I should, um, like what time frame I should be looking for the internship, like who would be able to help me out in terms of figuring that out? Yeah, it, it's Josh, it's Robert, it's me, right? Any one of us, we all know the same information. Okay, cool. Any last questions? I think we're coming to a wrap up. You all know where, where, where we live and our emails. So you certainly can follow up as questions come, but is there any, anything else for the good of the group? So let me make one last thing. If you're an early entry student, I don't know if anybody's an early entry student that's on, um, you will probably do your, well, I know you will do your internship later. Um, it's going to be after you're actually a full-time graduate student. It's not going to be when you're part of the early entry program. You could do, I don't want to stop you from doing an internship during the summer, after your senior year, when you graduate with a BS, if you're an early entry, that's a great experience. And I would encourage you to do that. It just won't be for the credit. But not everything has to be for credit. We're specifically talking about when it is for credit here. But with that, no other questions. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll see you next Monday at the Bank of America session, 4 o'clock. Thank you, guys. See you. Gentlemen, thank you.